Welcome to CNBC Africa's coverage of the Africa Investment Forum here at the Santon Convention Center just over the road. We'll be covering it live every step of the way over the next three days with analysis, interviews, and uh, we're going over very, very shortly to the first, one of the first panels over there, the uh, Africa Presidential panel. We'll be linking live in a second, but uh, the African Investment Forum, it'll be going on for uh, three days. Uh, last night here in the studio, we had Akinwumi Arashina, the head of the African Development Bank, who uh, was, is behind this. It's his brainchild, the Africa Investment Forum. And he was saying last year, they got something like $38 billion in investment. And uh, this year, they're looking for more, uh, $68 billion in investment is the target. They're looking for energy, they're looking for mining, they're looking for property, they're looking for manufacture and trying to blend that investment with uh, private money and also a little bit of public money so they can take some of the risk out of it and they can encourage more people in to invest in the continent. Now shortly uh, when we go to the Santon Convention Center, we're going to be getting one of the high-powered early panels there today. I shall be there with my team for the rest of the day, uh, trying to cover exactly what's going on and speak to some of the big names in business in Africa and the world. But uh, we'll be going over right now to the presidential panel at the Santon Convention Center. Could you kindly move to the side, all photographers to the back of the hall, please. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this African Investment Forum conversation with heads of state as we talk about investing in the African space. My name is Victor Oladukun and I'm the Director of Communication at the African Development Bank. It is an exceedingly great pleasure to have with us on this panel, His Excellency Cyril Ramaphosa, President of the Republic of South Africa. His Excellency Paul Kagame, President of the Republic of Rwanda. His Excellency Nana Akufo Addo, President of the Republic of Ghana. His Excellency Prime Minister Carlos Agostino do Rosario, representing His Excellency Felipe Inyusi, President of the Republic of Mozambique. And with us is the Premier of Hauteng Province in the audience, Honorable David Makura. All protocols observed. Excellencies, this is a specially curated event that brings together several global and regional investors who are active on our continent. This is also a platform that allows your excellencies to do several things. Use this opportunity to pitch your investment needs and opportunities, set the stage for conversations that will be held later on in boardroom sessions over the next three days, and more importantly, an opportunity for you to own the narrative around the opportunities your respective countries do provide. We'll be so I'll go ahead. This is a conversation, and it's a conversation between yourselves and investors from around the globe and our region. But I'll kick off our session with the first opportunity and pitch. Your Excellencies, every single one of you have been in the news recently for all the good reasons. So I say congratulations to you on the excellent work that you're doing, your vision and your leadership in leading our continent. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, you, it'll be quite appropriate to give our excellencies a warm round of applause. I'm gonna take my seat in just a moment, but my first question to you, and I'm gonna start with President Ramaphosa first. Why is it that investors in this room should pay attention and recognize your GPS coordinates here in South Africa as the place to do business in the region. Over to you, Mr. President. Well, thank you very much. We welcome this opportunity, and I think I speak on behalf of my brothers here. 
This uh, forum has become a marketplace for attracting investment to our great continent. And obviously, as we sit here, we will talk about our own countries. But more broadly, we want to have a broader continental look because Africa's time has come for investments. And we want serious investors who will look at the whole continent and particularize it and look at various countries for investment opportunities. And we've got great ones. For South Africa, we've got uh, a very uh, attractive investment uh, opportunities in a number of sectors. And right now, we're focusing on areas like infrastructure, uh, on energy, on the manufacturing uh, base that we have in our country, and seeking to industrialize more and more in areas like automotive, agro-processing, and energy uh, implements. So those are areas that we, we, we're focusing on that we believe can attract a whole lot of investments, and they do mutate into a number of other subsectors. We believe that we are the tourism uh, capital of our continent. Uh, when God created Africa, he spent quite a lot of time on South Africa. Uh, <laughs> to make South Africa as attractive as it is. When you come in right from the bottom, you see Table Mountain, and once you do so, even as you want to travel through the whole continent, which you must, uh, you'll find that you want to spend a little bit more time in South Africa. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you very much, President Ramaphosa. And we'll go on next to President Kagame. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you. Uh, I think building on what uh, President Ramaphosa has just mentioned, uh, when you look at uh, Africa as a whole, there is uh, a lot of progress, a lot of uh, activities taking place that are really raising uh, Africa to a much higher level. I, I want to simply say I have always thought it was Africa's time. I think we, 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 only, we Africans have let ourselves down, and we, we are now, I think, uh, realizing that uh, it has always been our time, and we need to seize every opportunity and be where we should be by now. So for, first of all, I also want to thank uh, President Ramaphosa, the President of South Africa, and uh, the government and the private sector for providing a very uh, good environment for us to be here to discuss these issues and thank the President of the African Development Bank uh, that has put uh, all this together with uh, the South African leadership. For Rwanda, particularly, we have concentrated on uh, creating a conducive business environment uh, for people to invest, to do business in Rwanda with the environment of predictable governance systems and security, and uh, uh, so far, so good uh, in a region of this African community that uh, is probably the fastest growing region on our continent, and Rwanda being part of that and benefiting from uh, that as well. And Rwanda being uh, the second uh, in the ranking for in Africa uh, for the ease of doing business. The World Bank ranking puts uh, Rwanda number two. I think we have held that position for quite some time. It's high time we became number one, so we are <laughs> <laughs> So we continue to do that. Uh, so we, we need to create that environment for people to come and invest, and uh, it's in the area. Three things I would want to mention, but they are probably 15. I'll just uh, be very brief. We have created uh, a number of things. One, we have uh, uh, agri-business hub we have created uh, between 15 and 20,000 hectares that we are trying to put under irrigation and 
partner with the private sector for uh, agribusiness and exports around that. That one we expect to have uh, a public-private partnership. Uh, second, we have also created uh, Kigali Innovation City, uh, where uh, technology companies and high institutions of learning uh, come together with uh, financial services uh, to allow uh, the startup companies to develop and grow and uh, so expect uh, private uh, capital to come in and grow that. The last one, not last but not least, uh, of the three is the Kigali Innovation Fund, which we have created. And uh, with the support of the African Development Bank, we have already put in money, and the government is putting money. We want private people to come and uh, invest as well to help uh, these startups that are, are growing. So you are most welcome. I, I, I reserved the beauty part for another discussion. <laughs> Because, uh, well, uh, President sorry. Kagame, I'm going to say that was um, an excellent pitch for Rwanda there. Um, I know that um, President Akufuado is chomping at the bit to top uh, Rwanda in this regard. So, President Akufuado, over to you. Given me, given me to attend this, uh, this forum, I was here last year and he's found it possible to renew the invitation. I'm grateful to him and equally grateful, of course, to the world champion, the rugby world champion. <laughs> uh, President Cyril Matamela Ramaphosa for the, the warmth and the hospitality that we always get when we come here. Very grateful for that. I think that the, I have a, a very big responsibility. I'm the sole West African here, so I have also to bat for West Africa a little bit. We have Southern Africa. <laughs> But um, the, the, the Ghanaian perspective, I think two things. First of all, I want very much to endorse what President Ramaphosa said, the need for us to have a continental framework in the way in which we're talking about economies in West Africa, in, in Africa. Um, the African continental free trade area is a major step forward for us, and we have found the overwhelming majority, I think, press unanimity on the continent in adhering to its term, Ghana has been privileged to be chosen as the host of its secretariat, and all the initiatives are onward going to make sure that by the target date, the, 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 the tra free trade area becomes a reality. And when it does so, it changes so many of the dynamics of the economics of our, of our, of our, of our situation. So I think it's extremely important when we're having this kind of meeting that we have very much this immediate future in mind when our economies hopefully are going to be locked into a common market uh, with all the, the commonalities that that involves for the development of Africa. This, the specific Ghanaian context, what we've been doing since I came into office nearly three years ago is to strengthen the macroeconomy of our country. We inherited a situation and a large fiscal deficit that has been turned around now, considerable imbalances in the way in which our economy was being run, and that has also been turned around. The 15, 16% rate of inflation is today at 7%, the lowest in two decades in, in, in the management of our national economy. And these are the building blocks for us. The macroeconomy, we think, is extremely important that we maintain discipline in the way in which we manage our public finances. And that has been our major objective. And so far, so good. We are realizing and we are resisting the temptation in an election year which is about to go to t turn on the tap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hoping that the work we have done will take us through without having to do that. But. Um, the, so that's one uh, very important background 
to the, the development of the Ghana and the rest of it, and the, the, the consequences of it, of course, has been that in these three years, we've had one of the fastest growing economies, not just on the continent, but in the world, 8%, 7%, 7, this year we're looking at a 7.6% growth, and it's been consistent over these last three years. So you have an expanding economy that, of course, presents opportunities, especially in three key areas, our infrastructure. Uh, it's, a, it's a common problem across the continent, but uh, it's one which we're paying a great deal of attention to, the development of our road, our rails, and our airport infrastructure in the country. In fact, last year here, uh, an important initiative that we launched last year, which is bearing fruit, is the Accra SkyTrain project, in which South African investors are taking a very keen interest. And we're hoping that we will be able to, to advance the, the whole concept even more strongly this, this year. So we have that. We have also the transformation of our agriculture. It doesn't make sense that on this continent we keep still being a net importer of food when we have everything that is there to be able to grow food for ourselves. Our land, we have our, the, the, the greatest proportion of the arable lands of the world are in Africa. Ghana has a very high proportion of that. We have waters that are running through our system and capable of being the fountain of irrigation. So we're also paying a great deal of attention to the modernization of our agriculture. We have a program which we call Planting for Food and Jobs. That is proving to be, and I, mean, I want to be modest in saying so, but it's proving to be a spectacular success in Ghana. First of all, in the way in which it's addressing foodstuffs, we're now for the first time in over a decade exporting foodstuffs to our neighbors. Generally, there's a big thrust to the, uh, the development of our economy in Africa. Very, very keen in developing private sector interests because as you know, Ghanaian agriculture is largely smallholder agriculture. But then there is also the opportunity for large commercial agriculture to coexist side by side with the, with the smallholder, of the farmers who are looking for investments in that area. And the third is we've established a Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund. And we are looking for money uh, from outside also to invest in the fund. It becomes a major uh, leverage for us for attracting monies to deal with our infrastructure. So we have a broad range. Our country, as all you know, the country that used to be known as the Gold Coast, we have a lot of important minerals in our country. And we're looking to see how we can bring value to, to those imports, not to, uh, to those uh, resources, not just the export of them in their raw form, but enhancing their, their, their take in the value chain. I'm, I'd speak about gold, I'm speaking about manganese, I'm speaking of considerable bauxite resources, iron ore resources, lithium, which is now coming into play as a major uh, uh, natural resource. All of these are in abundance in Ghana, and we're now trying to forge the policies that will make it possible for these also to be the subject of, uh, of, uh, of investment. I, like the President of Rwanda, will leave out the beauty and the warmth of the Ghanaian people in my presentation. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Well, President Akufuado, thank you very much. We hear foundation, priorities, preparation, opportunity all bundled into one, and we do know that um, there's a very strong likelihood <coughs> that all three of your excellencies will be topped by His Excellency the Prime Minister, Carlos Agostino de Rosario, for your uh, pitch here. Thank you morning. so much. Allow me to respond in, in Portuguese. I don't know whether this condition has been created for that. Uh, first of all, muito obrigado por é uma grande honra para mim estar aqui. Very committed to ensuring transparency and uh, to fighting corruption. My country has uh, done a lot to curb inflation under uh, the leadership of our president. We have been able uh, to control inflation over the past uh, three years 
we have gone from 27 uh, percent to um, 13 percent uh, inflation rate. We also have uh, the uh, required leadership and resources, uh, specifically human resources, a youthful population. We have a population of uh, 29 million, 27% uh, uh, of which uh, uh, are youth. Uh, our youthful population are eager to work. We have uh, also been intent on uh, training uh, our youthful population. We also uh, have uh, plentiful natural, uh, natural resources, uh, natural gas. We have a major project uh, uh, relating to uh, natural gas in Mozambique. And uh, we, uh, therefore, are very eager to take part in this uh, platform. I believe that we also uh, need uh, to discuss uh, the oil sector. We are um, working in agriculture, in energy, in uh, gas exploitation in Mozambique. These are all very important sectors in my country. Our economy, therefore, is quite diversified. And this is why we really want uh, this uh, gas exploitation to be conducted uh, sustainably and uh, in environmentally uh, friendly uh, manner. We uh, do not uh, want uh, to cause any environmental uh, uh, issues or uh, problems in our uh, gas exploitation activities. And this is why we have committed to, to protect uh, the environment. We uh, have also established a conducive environment uh, for investment. Uh, Mozambique uh, has uh, uh, experienced some uh, tensions or issues at its borders, uh, but uh, we have taken all necessary measures to uh, uh, to uh, resolve uh, these issues at our borders. Uh, as I said, we have uh, established a conducive environment in our uh, country that's uh, uh, also has a significant coastal area. Greatly appreciated. Again, another excellent pitch. We've discussed everything here from agriculture, tourism, industry, innovation, um, wonderful opportunities. I'm sure our excellencies have whetted your appetite. So we're going to turn it over to you, our global and regional <coughs> investors. We do have microphones on the sides of the hall. Uh, we, at this point, due to the limitations of time, only have an opportunity to address one question each to each other present. So as a matter of courtesy, I'm just going to ask if the person before you has addressed their question to a specific uh, present on the panel, please extend the next question to another member of the panel in order to provide equal opportunity. I see a hand raised right in front of me over here, but I'm gonna start with the lady right in front of me. If you could um, introduce yourself and ask your question, kindly keep all questions short for reasons of time. Good morning. Questions, not comments. Thank you very much. Hello. You're on. Good morning. My name is Leila Bouamatou. I am the first CEO woman uh, of an African investment bank in Mauritania. And uh, my question is for our president, addressed to President Kagame, uh, potential Africa's potential access to foreign investment is, uh, is hampered by the unstable macroeconomic policies, lack of trans transparency regarding, in, in, like regarding political um, environment, and lack of good governance. According to your successful experience and the successful story of your country, what advice are you going, can you give us as foreign investors. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll take the, we'll take the questions very quickly and then come uh, to the panel. So we'll take the next question. Yes, sir. Good morning, Your Excellencies. My name is Abdul Samad Rabiu, Chairman Boa Group from Nigeria. And my question goes to the uh, President of South Africa. You know, uh, Your Excellency, you've said it all about the beauty of South Africa. And, as you all know, South Africa is one of the most beautiful countries in Sorry, Africa. I didn't, I didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I will repeat, it's one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful country in Africa. And, let's uh, let's, let's kind of keep the questions yes, short, so short, please. My Excellency, Your Excellency, my question is, 
you know, as investors, you know, that are trying to invest all over Africa, we have this unfortunate incident of xenophobia. What are you doing to firmly address the issue of xenophobia here in South Africa? Because if investors are coming, they must feel, you know, embraced and welcomed. So what are you doing to firmly address this very ugly incident, Your Excellency? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take another question. Um, any other hands raised? Uh, the hand to the right, and then we'll come to the gentleman <coughs> in the middle, and that will be the, those will be the two last questions. Uh, good morning, Your Excellencies. My name is Ade Adefeko. I'm Vice President of Olam Agribusiness Company, which is in 25 countries in Africa. A quick question to Mrs. President Kagame and President Ramaphosa. No, it's no, two no, in one no, because no, it's connected. No, Ade, please. We will follow protocol. Um, we did say we'll give each of the presidents one opportunity to respond to a question. So please ask the question um, of either of the presidents who haven't been given an opportunity. All right, at this point in time, then I will go to the president of Rwanda. Your Excellency, President of Rwanda. No, <laughs> President Kagame has already received a question. Please, President Akufo and Prime Minister Rosario is right over right. here. Thank you. All right, I'll speak in Portuguese at this point and I'll address it to the President uh, uh, Bondia. Good morning, Southern Nigeria. I'm from Nigeria. What are you doing with regards to investing in agriculture and fisheries in Mozambique? So what investments are you making so that you encourage the neighboring countries to invest in your country? Thank you very much. And I do trust that the last question um, will be going to His Excellency President Akufuado. Thank you. Yes, the lady with the hat raised. Yes, thank you. Good morning, my name is Dr. Tony Luck. I've just become a citizen of Ghana, so I was very happy to say to my, yes, Mr. President, South Africa, you left me. <clears throat> I wanted to know, um, for all of us, what was the courage and intention that you had when you decided to change the way in which the cocoa would be handled? Because I think that that helps all of us understand how we will integrate into the global market if African presidents get the courage and the intention to use a very important word, which is no, we will do it a different way. Thank you very much, Dr. Locke. So your excellencies, in the order that the questions have been asked, we turn the microphones back over to you. So we'll start with President Kagame first and then come over to President Ramaphosa, Prime Minister Rosario, and then finally, but not the least, President Akufuado. Thank you very much, excellencies. Let me start by saying that uh, to the good question raised, the issues we have to deal with in Africa uh, in order for us to attract investments, have uh, business uh, environment uh, attractive and, and therefore grow and you know, develop and be where our countries want to be. Uh, there are these issues of governance that we know have to be considered and in fact invested in as well, at least in terms of effort that uh, such happens in our countries. Then issues of stability, uh, whether it is political or other issues that uh, affect our, st our stability when you have conflicts, you have security issues we have seen. So there is nothing new uh, that uh, we don't know we have to deal with. I think all of us know what issues we have to deal with. The main difference will come when uh, in one place or another, they are actually doing what they know they ought to do. Uh, it's not just knowing what you ought to do or what you are even capable of doing, 
uh, whether it's another, in actual fact, doing it. So when we have seen across Africa uh, progress uh, happening in, and, and there are many positive things happening in every country of our continent. Uh, so they, they, they are not happening by miracle or, or anything. It's, it's just because people are getting to doing what they have to do and have known they have to do for a long time. So the, the advice, therefore, is, is simple. Let's do what we know we ought to do. Let's involve our women. We see more numbers of women becoming CEOs because there are many who are capable, so we should not leave our women behind. That's what we have tried to address. We know we have to have uh, accountable, transparent uh, systems of government, and we have to make sure we do that. We have to create uh, rule of law in our environment for people to expect certain things to happen, and they, that's what happens in any country. So that, that is the main advice. I, I cannot give advice of things that I, I think that anyone doesn't know in this room. Everyone knows what we are talking about. Okay. Let's just do it. Okay. <laughs> President Kagame, uh, that's a plug for Nike there. Just do it. <laughs> um, an excellent exhortation there. President Ramaphosa. Thank you very much. The issue that has been raised, and it falls in the category of the whole global challenge that many countries are facing, which is the issue of migration, how people move from one country to another, and some move because of economic conditions and political conditions and all that. And South Africa has always welcomed people from many other parts of the world. And in fact, right now we are one of the big recipients of people who have migrated to our country, fleeing their various countries for a number of reasons, and uh, our neighbors who have gone through challenges. We've seen them, uh, their people coming into South Africa. And in the main, they have settled here. We're very different from a number of other countries in that we decided not to set up what you would call reception centers where people would be kept in camps. We consciously decided that we want people who come to our country to be integrated into the South African society and be part of it, to be able also to make a living and to be part of the broader South African society. And some have criticized us for that and said, you should have set up camps, but we, we, we've resisted doing that. But as we all know, when a country goes through difficult economic conditions itself. Citizens of the country have a sense of propriety. They have a sense of self-interest, and they want to protect their own self-interest. It happens all over the world. And I characterize it as a fault line. Migration issues become a fault line in the life of any country, and sometimes reaction is sparked off by what you would call nonsensical incidents, uh, whether somebody greeted another one in a different language or whether they couldn't answer in a different language and it just sparks off. Inherently, South Africans are not xenophobic. The government of South Africa is irrevocably committed against xenophobia. We abhor it, we've got policies that are aimed at, uh, at uh, diluting it and uh, taking action against it. And uh, attacks on people from other countries are seen as a criminal act. In the recent past, of course, the unfortunate thing is that a number of people died. And many of them were South Africans who got caught up in the whole fracas that happened in a number of areas. And then the, when things like this happen, the criminal element kicks in and people start seeing opportunities uh, to, to, to act in, an, in a very incorrect way. Now, the problem that often happens with all this is that fake news becomes the order of the day. And in our situation, much of what happened was then fueled by fake news. And uh, some of it happened in such a very ugly and gross way, where people were seen 
there was pictures that were sent around, people jumping out of buildings that were burning. And they said, this is what is happening in South Africa. And it wasn't. It was people burning, jumping out of a building which was you know, accidentally on fire in another country. And they transposed it and said, this is what is happening in South Africa, which then fueled the reaction of people in other countries, in Nigeria, for instance. And at the time as it happened, I was in close contact with President Buhari. And uh, people, uh, the, the security forces in Nigeria, you know, took a firm stance to, to help and defend South Africans who were there and their businesses. And similarly, we then took action here. Two, more than 200 people were arrested because we also needed to demonstrate our firmness in taking action against those who were acting against people from, from other countries. And things have settled down. And I was very pleased that President Buhari did not cancel his trip, state visit to South Africa in the wake of what happened. He still came, we sat down and discussed it uh, in, a, in a very uh, pleasant manner, friendly manner, and we decided that we are going to set up an early warning uh, mechanism that will give us early indications of anything that, that could go wrong. But in addition to that, I then sent a number of envoys to various countries. They went to, to, to uh, uh, see President Kagame, uh, President uh, uh, Kufo, uh, Nana Akufo in, uh, in, in Ado in um, uh, Ghana, and they're also going to go now, now in a few days to Mozambique. They're still going around. Uh, just to explain exactly what has happened, but more than that, uh, without taking too much time, we decided that we are going to set up a fact-finding uh, team, which consists of former President Chisano of Mozambique and former President of Tanzania, Kikwete, they will work with a number of other local South Africans to get to the bottom of this, because we want to prevent further incidents of all this. Clearly, as a nation, we've got to take steps to ensure that South Africans have a greater appreciation of people from other countries, uh, that we are not an island, and uh, being the country that we are, we were also supported by in our struggle by other countries on the continent who welcomed us with open arms. And as South Africans, we need to have that level of acceptance, level of embrace to other people. So we are irrevocably committed uh, to, to taking action against xenophobic attacks against others. But we would also say we want to work with the continent. We want to work with uh, the whole world, and indeed we're also working with the UN uh, Commission on Refugees, and they have applauded the policies that we have embraced when it comes to treating refugees. So we want to say once again, South Africa is home to all. We want people to feel comfortable and safe in being in South Africa, and of course there's got to be processes that uh, have to deal with being uh, regularized to be in South Africa, uh, being permitted to have the necessary permits and all that, which happens in any other country. But South Africa, one, is not xenophobic. Two, South Africa uh, is open to other people from other countries. And we want people to have a sense that this, too, is their home away from home. Thank you very much. President Ramaphosa, I just want to say thank you very much for dealing factually and very sensitively with an issue that has become very thorny on our continent, particularly as we stand on the cusp of operationalizing the African Continental Free Trade Zone. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Again, could we kind of give President Ramaphosa a warm round of applause. Thank you, sir. Prime Minister Rosario. Yes. As I told you initially, Agriculture in our countries is, uh, is uh, vital for job creation. Vital for the creation of income generation. In our country, also for the production. That's why I said that, he, in spite we have uh, endowed in natural resources such as uh, LNG, we don't need that LNG can be developed in jeopardizing agriculture and in the other sectors that are job creations. 
We have in Mozambique uh, about 3 million hectares, but only 10% of what we 10% is being utilized. So we have um, plenty of scopes to, to be there. Crops like maize, uh, uh, cashnet, uh, uh, cotton, so which we are bringing here, some project on, the, on this, are there to be. We are now looking for modernization of our agriculture, which, which is uh, very, very crucial. And now the land is there, it has been given as a leasing base. We are not selling the land in Mozambique. It's a concession of about 50, 50 years, renewable, depending on how we are using the land. So come to Mozambique, the land is there. Two conditions are there. We have been working hard so that peace can prevail, number one. And then, as I said, the inflation is also under control. During the past last three years, we have been controlling the inflation. We brought inflation from 26% for now 3%, which is an amazing effort we did. But peace, macroeconomic stability, and the lead availability are there. Please come to Mozambique. Well, you've, you've heard it consistently from Prime Minister Rosario. His message has been, he's, he's focused on three messages. Agriculture, agriculture, and agriculture. So you heard it from His Excellency. Well, last but not the least, President Akufo Addo, over to you, sir. First of all, uh, let me thank uh, the new citizen, the new Ghanaian citizen for the question. And um, I'm, I'm thinking that you're part of those who we are granting citizenship for the year of return. Uh, there's a whole big ceremony that I'm uh, due to superintend when I get back home, where so many of our kith and kin from the Americas and the Caribbean are coming to be citizens of Ghana. So you're very welcome, and thank you for the question. I think that the question goes, is a sort of a microcosm of the, of the, of the challenge that we're facing on the continent. And um, why do I say so? Between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, we're responsible for 65% of the world's output of cocoa. The cocoa industry, chocolate and all the related parts, is a uh, hundred billion plus United States dollar industry. Well, the global industry. A value chain that produces some 100 billion dollars plus. Out of that, the farmers whose hard work and toil is responsible for the cocoa, the 65%, get six billion plus maximum for their effort. You look at those facts and you know that there's something seriously wrong with that arithmetic. So uh, when I came into office, I, I began to speak about it. And very fortunately for me uh, and for our two countries, the Ivorian leader, Lassan Ouattara, had the same point of view as myself. We found that we had a joint uh, mutual assessment of what was the reality and the need for us to do something about the reality. I see that is the most important aspect of political office, the, the, the opportunity it gives to you to address fundamental issues of confronting your people. So as a result of talks in Abidjan and in Accra, we came to a mutual understanding of what we needed to do, which was to fuse the marketing, the production and marketing policies of our two countries. Uh, the Cocoa Marketing Bo uh, Cocoa Board is the main instrument, state instrument for the development of the cocoa. And they have a Conseil de Cacao Cafe in Côte d'Ivoire, which is, plays an equivalent role there. So it is a question of bringing the two groups together to forge a common policy. And they have done so, insisting that in future we would enter the market uh, at a certain basic floor price, 
and hold, hold that price and then out of it find the opportunity to increase the earnings of our farmers. So that floor price has been stated. We've gone into the market on that basis. We now have the opportunity to pay our farmers a $400, if you like, bonus, which we call the living income differential per ton, and enhancing the, 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 the incomes of our cocoa farmers so that they get more out of this value, this $100 billion industry that they've been given before. And we also found tremendous support from the African Development Bank, which is, is indicated and has as part of the agreements that we're going to sign here, that they are prepared to support us enhancing our infrastructure in the cocoa industry, being able to have a greater capacity for warehousing, being able to do more processing in our country of the, of the raw material, and therefore being able to participate at the higher and higher level of the value chain in the cocoa industry. And the end result of all of this is going to be a considerable enhancement of the incomes of our cocoa farmers. Unfortunately, I think that um, the more progressive elements of the world industry have seen the value of the policy. Mars, the United States company, which is one of the biggest players in the industry, has come out openly to support the policy that uh, the Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire have evolved together, to say that it is the way to ensure a sustainable industry. So, um, like everything in history, I mean, there's a combination of, of luck, of uh, the, the time was ripe, uh, the circumstances were there, and I found um, uh, an interlocutor who shared the same vision as myself. So it was easy for us to work together towards this common goal. He's, in fact, the bigger producer. He's the number one producer. Cote d'Ivoire is the number one producer. We are the second. But between us, we come to this figure of 65%. So it, is, it has been a development that has been, uh, I believe, very, very positive for our two countries. And I, I, I think that uh, it, it, it means that we're capable of duplicating this kind of thinking on a broad range of things that we need to do on the continent. But this is the origin of the policy, and this is where we're going, and we're hoping that um, uh, it, it, it's, it was going to, with the support, as I say, that the ADB is giving us, be able to give us a really strong future position as the industry grows. Thank you. President Akufuado, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on charting new and strategic pathways for agriculture, not just in Ghana, but also within the region. I'd like to use this opportunity to say a very profound and sincere thank you to our distinguished panel of heads of state and government for enriching our conversation today. But more importantly, in your respective and very unique ways for continuing to own and to shape the narrative on the new Africa, the Africa of our dreams, the Africa that we've all looked forward to. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly give our distinguished panel a final but really warm and robust applause. And we've had a very interesting conversation that I just rounded up with the African president in conversation. I have with me my colleague here, Fifi Peters. And Fifi, you were in that conversation. What were those presidents saying? I mean, very interesting indeed, Ken. Ultimately, this is being described as the marketplace for the continent to look for investments, to do deals. And the strong message that came uh, from, from the various heads of state that were on the panel in that room, and that was the heads of state from Rwanda, from South Africa, um, a representative, in fact, the prime minister from Mozambique. And of course, we also had the, 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 the president of, of Ghana, uh, President Nana Kufado. They were in a room full of local and global investors, essentially to make investment pitches as to why uh, uh, money should flow to their respective countries. Of course, I mean, the ultimate goal is to grow Africa together, but uh, within Africa and the pockets of the 55 countries on the continent, it was all right, what share of the pie can our respective countries get? Yeah, one, one interesting theme that I kind of noticed is the fact that they were all talking about the fact that Africa's time has come. And also, they all try to make a case for you know what areas of investment you know you know investors can be looking at in their countries. Let's take a look quick at some of the countries, and let's start from your president here in South Africa. 
Of course, I mean, uh, you know, talking about Africa's time has come, the president of Rwanda, um, Paul Kagame, said Africa's time has, it, 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 it has been, it always has essentially been Africa's time. But um, we'll get to what he had to say in, in, in a short moment. From South Africa's point of view, uh, President Amaposa spoke about the various opportunities that um, investors can tap into by way of the infrastructure space, by way of the energy space, but he particularly focused on tourism. In fact, saying that when God created Africa, he spent extra time on South Africa because he believes that we are the most beautiful um, country on the continent. I mean, there was a general applause to that, so not too much of disagreement um, to what the president had to say regarding that. But yeah, getting money into the tourism sector, I mean, it is a low-hanging fruit for growth here in South Africa, but the proof will be in the pudding. I mean, the president speaking about the efforts that South Africa was trying to make to uh, improve the ease of doing business, so talking about the fact that transparency and accountability was, of course, important. Uh, for investors and that he was ensuring that these or he would ensure that these things were in place to ensure that capital felt safe here but yeah that was Ramaphosa's uh, uh, pitch specifically focusing on the beauty of, of the land. All right then so interesting conversation we, we had there also um, Kikpao Kagame also talked mm -hmm. about uh, the agribusiness hub that yeah, they are turning Kigali into Rwanda into and also the Kigali Innovation Hub which is also coming on, coming on board with, in partnership with the African Development Bank you know what else he has to say? I mean uh, quite a lot and uh, people were talking about East Africa, East Africa being one of the, uh, in fact the fastest growing region on the continent and uh, Paul Kagame talking about how that, that had benefited Rwanda also because essentially the region had um, helped pull Rwanda's growth higher. But what he did emphasize was the reason why Rwanda is getting so much investment and so much attraction from the local and the global investment community is because of the systems that they have put in place again to address accountability, to address, tr to address uh, transparency to ensure good governance and in fact he had to feel the question from investors to say that you know Mr. President how is it that you're doing this um, and what is your advice to other African countries and his advice was really simple to say that there's no advice that's needed because we all know what needs to be done what needs to be done right now is let, let's just do it let's just do it all right then we'll still keep the live more live scenes coming here from the African Investment Forum we'll try to a quick break now and when we return we'll go to the opening plenaries you know happening here from the Santin Convention Center